my, my opinions about this, not, not surprisingly. Um, but of course, I don't really know what happened because, of course, it was all done secretly, uh, confidentially. My impression, my impression is that the Scottish-based special advisors swallowed the message that they were being given by the senior members of Sage, in particular uh, Whitty, and I've forgotten his name, the other guy, Whitty, and uh, is one of them anyway. And I, I think they were kind of with it. And the reason I say that is there were things that uh, Jason Leach said quite early on that seemed to be pretty much in line with the Four Nations approach, led, dominated by the, um, the so-called experts in the, the Sage group. Well, we've seen recently that you know some of the Sage group actually were dissidents in, in that, but uh, Valance and, and Whitty uh, drove that. And it was clearly heading towards, um, heading towards, to my mind, a herd immunity strategy. And I think that was being encouraged, of course, by Dominic Cummings and I think welcomed by Boris Johnson. At some point, I think once once people saw the, the tsunami of death on the horizon, the the herd immunity people like like Whitty and lost their nerve and decided to push for lockdown. And I think by this time the Scottish based advisors like like Leach and there, there, there no doubt there would have been others, um, I think they realised what was happening and started to give um, the Scottish political leadership new advice. And that's a point at which I think the Scottish political leadership would have liked to lock down even quicker. But I think that, I think that's what happened. I, I, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 the opposition parties, backed by, obviously, by most of the media, um, pretty much, or and serviced by the media as a kind of vehicle or a platform for, for opposition parties, it was entirely hypocritical. And on the one hand, on the one hand, if the Scottish government had resisted the pressure to comply with the Four Nations approach, to go along with the advice from people like Whitty at Sage, that in retrospect, very dangerous advice about trying to time the lockdown, you know, waiting, waiting and timing the lockdown. That was nobody else in Europe was was, was talking that way. Um, I think that um, had the, the Scottish political leadership in the government had they tried early on. To break away with a Scottish uh, strategy, they would have been castigated by the media and by by the, the opposition parties. Then, of course, because they did, um, to some extent, uh, collaborate for, for a week or two, they are now being blamed by those same opposition parties and by the the media of having dithered and and told that had they had they gone for lockdown earlier, they would have saved lives. You know, we had Edinburgh University saying a thousand lives were lost because the lockdown came too late in Scotland. But we, but, we, but we know that the evolution of the right to lockdown only came on the 25th of March. So my, I'm, I'm quite uh, quite uh, angry about the, the media coverage, but uh, I often am, because it was distinctly, um, you know, uh, hypocritical. Um, the, the Scottish government couldn't really win. Yes, the, 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 the briefings, as you, as you say, have been handled in a very impressive uh, professional, well-prepared way. And not, not just Nicola Sturgeon, I've been very impressed by Jean Freeman in all of this. And uh, Nicola's a much more presidential sort of figure. Um, Jean Freeman's not quite so kind of charismatic, but I think there, there are some of the things that Jean Freeman says, which I think I, I admire. She's much more, much more prepared to stand up against the, uh, the journalists and to contradict them. And she often tweets to put them in their place. And Nicola tends to be still with this this kind of strategy where you just appear mature, superior, competent, and the public will like that. And the opinion polls support that. The public do like uh, her, her approach. Um, but I think you know, the, and I think the um, the opposition parties in the media have identified Jean Freeman as 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 for them the weak link because she's directly involved in the, the NHS. So um, I, I, again. They very, I have a very negative view of the, the way the media have behaved here. In the actual briefings, the journalists have come across really as teenagers speaking to mature adults with petty little concerns, constantly trying to dig up something confrontational and being handled calmly and uh, professionally by the First Minister. It's been, it's been, I think, and I think some of the opinion polls show this, that the journalism has always been uh, and a, a distrusted <laughs> profession uh, globally, but the, the Scottish journalists, I think, have held them very low esteem, and, and polls support that. And the First Minister has held them very high esteem. So you know, hard evidence there. 
I, I'm, yeah, I, can, I can be naive like all of us, but I think it would be naive to think that all of this will, all of this will last. I think, I think the, the longer term impact will be a bit of a boost for the independence movement, but I don't think a huge one. I think a lot of the people who have been, you know, people who support Labour, Lib Dems, Conservatives even, who have been impressed by the First Minister, some of them may be turned, but I think it would be naive to think a large number will. I think a large number of the Labour ones probably will, but I think, you know, one of the um, one of the polls, uh, and this was, uh, it was YouGov, and it was a Scottish poll, and in that, 70% of, Scot- of Conservative voters approved of the Scottish Government handling. 70% of Conservative voters. An astonishing figure um, that that's the case. So, um, and, you know, I think, I think to think that they will, when this is, is over, if it's ever over, when this is over, that they will not return to unionism, I think, would be naive. Well, you, you know, um, Professor Curtis, obviously, a very, very establishment figure. Um, but um, what, what he said was, and I thought this was just quite, quite um, depressing in some ways, this, this was the, the only analysis the BBC commissioned of that particular poll, the Ipsos Mori poll, which showed you know a lot of support for the Scottish Government strategy, was by Professor Curtis. There was no balancing analysis. But his, his argument was that the Scottish Government benefits from a halo effect, whereby credit for what is done well in Scotland is attributed to Holyrood and blame for poor performance is laid at the door of Westminster. I thought it was an astonishing thing for an educated man to say. It's, is there at all any evidence of a halo effect in Scotland? You've only got to look at the, the daily coverage, you know, by the by the, the Herald and the Scotsman, and, and uh, in particular, and the uh, and the BBC, to see there's a pretty tarnished halo if they think there's a, a halo effect here. So I was quite uh, quite surprised by that, and, and and to some extent, what he's doing is is kind of implying that um, the Scottish government hasn't, in reality, done well. That it's just perception. And that's wrong, I think. I think that's very hard evidence of having done well. It's not an orchestrated uh, campaign at all, by any means, but there are there are prominent journalists and, and people like Professor Curtis who realise that the, the Scottish government has um, come across very well, in particular the First Minister, but I think also the Health Secretary, have come across very well, and they think the only way to deal with this is to suggest that it is a con job. That it's, that it's a PR job, and that underneath that, the Scottish government has not done well, and Scotland is not doing well in terms of its. And that, that's a widespread criticism. It's in, it's in the, the Financial Times have swallowed that argument and suggested that Nicola Sturgeon is somehow just a, 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 not a con job as such, but something like that. And uh, the Guardian, even the Guardian, have done that. Now, I've, 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 I've done stuff on my, my blog about this, and there, there are hard empirical pieces of evidence that show that Scotland has actually done well. There are some very obvious ones, but a much lower excess mortality rate. You'll know that many of the statistics are quite unreliable, but the, the excess mortality rate collected by the, um, the ONS in, in England and the NRS in Scotland, um, these are precise data based on deaths. And you can compare this year with last year, and you can see if there's an excess in this particular month. And the excess in Scotland is far lower than the excess in England. That is a clear, objective indicator that something is going better here. And then I'll explain what that might be. And I mean, obviously, I think it's partly, partly to do with NHS Scotland's performance. But uh, there, there are other indicators as well. Uh, higher recovery rate. These, uh, these are all on, on my blog linked to references. You know, that I, I wouldn't say these things with the a source. Um, the mort- this is one that's very interesting to my mind. The mortality rate amongst black and ethnic minority groups in Scotland is lower than for the white population. It's a staggering piece of information, completely ignored. And it's not because we only have a handful of people. This is this is among you know, 170,000 black and ethnic minority groups. The, the mortality rate is about 1%, um, where they make up 4% of the population. It's completely contrary. And I don't know why that is, but it's, a, but it's worthy of study. The death rate in care of the homes is actually lower, based on the work the Financial Times did. There's constant suggestions by people like Ruth Davison and uh, by Ian Murray that the death rate in Scottish care homes is higher, based on, on inadequate statistics. The mortality rate amongst key workers in Scotland is lower. There are assessment centres 
for uh, coronavirus um, cases, which have been protecting the, the general practice surgeries. There's better staffing in our hospitals. Our hospitals are cleaner because we, we have in-house cleaners. We don't have outsourced cleaners. And in, in the winter of last year, there were no major norovirus outbreaks. That's an indicator of how clean the hospitals are, whereas wards across England were shut. And, and finally, there is the, the argument that there has been better government leadership. And this is the one at which, of course, you know, people like Jackson Carlaw would be would be blowing their, their top over. And let me finish with, you know, for the moment with this particular, this quote. Mm -hmm. This has not been reported anywhere. Dr Stephen Cole, president of the Scottish Intensive Care Society, said a couple of days ago, Scotland has much to be proud of in the way that the pandemic has been managed. I have no doubt that the death toll would have been greater without the unwavering support and close working relationship between the government and the clinical community. That's a, a staggering quote in the context of all the bad news we hear, and yet no coverage. None at all that I'm aware of. This Sarah Smith incident raises the issue, which is a long-standing issue. Um, is, there, is there actually any kind of conspiracy, any kind of conscious political bias against the independence movement? And a lot of people will, will accuse you of you know, being paranoid if you argue there is. And I, I don't believe that in many individuals working in the media establishment, in particular in BBC Scotland, I don't believe that many of them are daily thinking, how can I undermine the Scottish government? I think for the vast majority of them, it's, it's a culture which they have, they have been socialised into as young journalists and which they, they don't really think about much. But the, 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 the consequence is bias against the independence movement. However, there are exceptions. Sarah Smith, Glenn Campbell perhaps, Lisa Summers, the, the health correspondent. There are far too many incidents over and over that, that to, to, for it to be excused as, as you described there. That's just the casual use of a word, like enjoyed. Um, Sarah Smith has a long record. Glenn Campbell has been seen tearing up SMP literature. Um, Lisa Summers lies constantly and misuses evidence and makes up um, accusations against uh, parts of the health service. These, these people, I think, are conspiring to some extent to undermine John, Neil, Noam Chomsky says that you don't need conspiracies. There are, there are no major conspiracies and much. You just need members of elites. And Sarah Smith is a member of a, a media elite and also, as you know, a political and family elite. Um, people like that act in their own interest. And their interests, their own interests are the same as the interests of the rest of the, the group they're part of, that elite. That kind of new labour elite, you might call them. So that when she does things, she's kind of acting naturally. It's just what seems logical and sensible to her. She's not thinking, I don't think, how can I get at people? Because you don't need that. You just need people to act in their own interest and then in, in so doing act in the interest of the... That particular idea that there is no major conspiracy at Pacific Key, um, a lot of people who follow me on, on the blog and so on um, don't share my kind of... They, they think I'm being so, so overkind. I had a present, did a presentation in Airdrie a wee while ago where... Um, I'd, I'd mentioned this point that I didn't think there was much of a conspiracy at the Pacific Key. And somebody in the audience, about 60 people in this audience in Airdrie, one of them said, you know, how can you how can you say that when this? And he gave an example of something that was, to him, clearly evidence. And at that point, I stopped and I said to the 60 people, well, tell, if you think there really is a conspiracy in, in Pacific Key, put your hand up. And there were 60 people there, and they all put their hands up. Every single one. <laughs> I was quite taken aback by that. I mean, they say when you mention Nazi Germany, you've, you've lost the argument. But but they, they, this notion, this notion of low-powered people and the lower levels in organisations working towards the leadership, you know, I, as I understand it, Hitler didn't have any ideas about tactics. But it, people tried to please him by coming up with ideas, and I think the same applies. And I think I think Pacific Key in 2014, when uh, when there were one or two senior staff there who were not there, um, was was clearly. Um, organised to 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 try and undermine the Yes campaign. It is the British Broadcasting Corporation. Why would it be otherwise? But it, it is clear. It is clear that the the opposition to independence movement, if I can call it that, has chosen health services as the battleground because the the, the Scottish government have been pretty competent in just about every area, and in some and in several areas, it's difficult to actually hit them 
because they can because people will say well they don't have control over that and the one area that's seen as sensitive is the health service and for some now, time now opposition parties and and the press and so on have been going at the health service daily and that's meant that i've i've been drawn in through my blog pretty much i've been drawn into a daily kind of rebuttal and i and, and concentrating on that and constantly trying to kind of criticize anything that's said about the health service and it's meant that some other areas such as this for example the one you've raised about the you know the nature of democracy in in, in this, this uk parliament is something i'll have to admit to being not quite uh, on the ball about my my own impression is that is that um westminster has been um uh, what's the word for it archaic and and uh, conservative surprise surprise in its in its uh, reaction to how it can cope in this situation and they've been unhappy i suspect that's partly to do with the fact that boris is a rabble rouser and i think boris needs a crowd behind him to actually win any argument because he doesn't have the will but all otherwise He's, I mean, I, I've been watching Keir Starmer and pick him to bits. I, I don't find Keir Starmer a tremendously impressive figure, but he, but he has a, an analytical and a forensic sort of ability as a, as a prosecution lawyer. But he's been, he's been pulling Johnson to bits all the time. And Boris can only win if he, if he rabble rouses and gets people to shout behind him. So the whole electronic thing doesn't suit them. His popularity has been falling uh, steadily over the last month or two. And uh, Conservative Home had a, a survey just yesterday which is interesting, as uh, Rishi Sunak is is the only one with a high rating, up at about 90% in the Conservative Party. Johnson has fallen to fourth place in that poll. And quite entertaining, of course. We'd, who do you think is bottom of the Conservative leadership in the UK at only 11.7? It's Jackson Carlo. <laughs> it's astonishing. 11.7%, and still he blusters and shouts in, in, in Hollywood. It was the same in the run-up to election. Do you remember they, they kept him under wraps because they know he's a loose cannon. They know they know he's only good for certain things. He's only good for these orchestrated situations with a crowd behind him, where he can do his, his Churchillian impression, and people will cheer. And uh, and I, I mean, one of the things I've noticed in the polls is the only place he's still popular now is Northern Ireland. And I, I and I wonder which housing scheme were they doing the survey in. It must be the ones with the red, white, and blue curbstones, because he's hugely popular apparently in the polls in Northern <laughs> Ireland. But um, he's, he, as you say, Nicholas Sturgeon has, has just done the work, and that's that's reflected in opinion poll after opinion poll, where she she's far and away the most impressive politician in the UK, I would say. Although I'm a big fan of Jean Freeman too. <laughs> and funnily enough, there's a, an article in the in Scotsman today from um, Guy Stenhouse. Who, mysterious figure often writes for the, the Scotsman, basically say, you know, who would you prefer as a friend? You know, Boris Johnson or Nicola Sturgeon? And he was referring to the treatment of the chief medical officer, ind indicating that he thought that, that Nicola had just fired her. There was no question of any kind of that the chief medical officer had decided to, to go herself. He was taking the view that Nicola was a very authoritarian figure and uh, that was a negative for him from the kind of libertarian perspective that, that he has. But it's been a very, as you've, you've picked this out, it's, it's been a tremendously sharp example of the difference, the professional approach of uh, the Scottish government with their chief medical officer, who clearly had made mistakes and clearly, you know, holds herself in too high a speed uh, if, she, if she thinks she can advise people to behave in a certain way and then behave differently herself. So I didn't have any kind of particular empathy for her. I think it was quite appropriate she resigned. Um, and the, the Dominic Cummings thing is just amazing, isn't it? Just utterly amazing that he, that you know he <laughs> he goes off he goes off to test his eyesight by driving somewhere, and and that that's all excused, you know. Um, the, the the prime minister prepared to sacrifice lives to keep his pal as an advisor. Appalling. As I understand it, I remember it briefly in passing, is is that Jackson Carlo um, clearly hadn't read the WHO report in terms of the, the, the subtlety of what there was this testing, testing, testing thing. And and constantly um, when it's when it's revealed in statistics that Scotland has greater testing capacity than it uses, that somehow is a red drag to the to the Tories and the opposition parties, and they all say, no, 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 you've got all this testing capacity and you're not using it. What a failure, they say. And I, and I think that misunderstands what the, the World Health Organization was saying about testing. They weren't saying test everybody. 
there's and uh, this is and this is only in a month in our ICU because I'm not a medic. As I understand it, the testing of the asymptomatic is problematic. That it, you can first of all it, the results are not reliable, and there's a danger in that. And this is something that I think Gene Freeman bats back, but that's more than Nicola does. And that's that it, this this constant call for keep on test more and more testing. You're not testing enough. You're failing, and therefore you're not meeting what the WHO say is to misunderstand. The WHO are saying are saying test tactically test test people in certain contexts, test people with symptoms. If you test the asymptomatic, and and the test says that they are free of the virus when actually they they're not free of it because they don't have the symptoms, then those people are empowered, have a sense of empowerment, and go into situations like care rooms or whatever and infect people because they think they're free. So that this is the, I think I've seen this quote: a bad test is worse than no test, and that doesn't come through. And I think that's what Nicola was getting at with Jackson Carlo not having read the whole thing properly. But surprise, surprise! I mean, he, he must be. I mean, he must be one of the least impressive politicians in, in living memory. I mean, I thought Ruth Davis was pretty bad, old bluster and show and no substance. But he's just appalling. And and in the opinion, in the recent opinion poll, eight percent. He was ahead of Richard Leonard on six <laughs> percent. Just uh, astonishing that that gap between the public perceptions of, of the leadership in one party and another. These, these are unheard of gaps between the one between Nicholas Sturgeon and the, the opposition parties, and, and Willie Rennie is nowhere to be seen at all. Another example. I'm sure there have been others before, where in in the absence of any kind of um, proper action by the UK government. In this area, the Scottish government have gone to the effort of producing um, a document, which is, I think, do you say it was described as forensic? I think, but, it, but I mean, I can't say it myself. But I, but it's not, it wouldn't be the first time that they've actually got on with it and done something. So uh, interesting to hear that. Um, yeah, I can't really say any more about it except to, I'm not surprised to to hear about that.